I would like to welcome you um, to this uh, session of the Data Site Annual Community Meeting 2023 uh, with the title Advancing Equity, Visibility, and Evaluation for Open Data, Data Sites Global Access Program, and Make Data Count. And um, I'd like to hand over to Iracha first to give an overview of um, Make Data Count, uh, a data site uh, strategic initiative. And um, I'm going to stop sharing now and hand over to you, Iracha, to give us the latest updates and uh, some insights into the future of Make Data Account. Thanks. Thank you so much, Paul, and hopefully the slides are displaying OK. Um, right, so thank you for the opportunity to, to give this overview about Make Data Account. Today, I was going to talk a little bit about the, the initiative work uh, that has happened in the context of data metrics, where Make Data Account has been involved. And also wanted to take a, a few minutes to tell you about a project that we have ongoing at data side that we are very excited about because we think that is going to really bring us forward in allowing different stakeholders to, to have it an easier way of a completing evaluation of, of data usage. Uh, right, so I'm pretty sure everyone in this audience will agree that data sharing is valuable. We care about it very much and we want to support it. But I think as a community, we tend to grapple more with the question of understanding the value of data sharing. Essentially, what is the, the value that we assign to it? And this may sound trivial, but it's actually something that is very important if we want to nurture and incentivize data sharing as a best practice, as a behavior that we would like to see in the research community. So we need to try to start understanding how data are found, access, analyze, and utilize as part of research activities, but also to inform a policy development. So some of the things that we need to start thinking about are questions such as who uses data, for what purposes, perhaps what are the data sets that are being underutilized, what's the impact of open data, is that translating into societal benefit, and what's the return on investment on all of our efforts in support of open data. And to be able to start providing some answers to these questions, we need a set of transparent and responsible data metrics to help us answer these questions. And this is where the Make Data Counting initiative comes into play. The whole focus of the initiative is in developing and promoting open data metrics to enable evaluation and reward of research data usage and impact. DataSite uh, plays a very key role in this initiative. It's one of the organization's strategic uh, initiatives, but we also work very closely with the community. This is a community effort involving different stakeholders. Uh, looking at the work of the Make Data Count initiative, there are three main areas of focus. One is to build open infrastructure and, and community-based standards to support adoption of open data metrics. Uh, the second is to advocate through outreach and adoption campaigns to essentially get others interested in supporting co-creation of these standards, but also in adopting uh, ways of implementation of, of open data metrics. And the third area is that we collaborate in bibliometric studies because we believe it is important that we build evidence that helps us contextualize data metrics and provide that important nuance in interpreting how the metrics can fit into different uses. And I thought I would spend a few uh, uh, moments just talking about what we mean by data metrics. Um, data metrics are meaningful and contextualized quantitative and qualitative measures of how open data sets are accessed and utilized. There are a number of ways in which we can start collecting information on this data usage, for example, through views, downloads, and citations. This is perhaps the things that you may have heard about in the context of, of, of conversations around data metrics. We know, of course, that views and loads and citations are not the whole picture of the possible uses of data, but there's, there are useful uh, measures because, for example, when we think about views and downloads, this gives us an indication that researchers have found that data set relevant to their work in some way. Again, this may mean different things, but they were interested in that data set in some manner. And for example, when we think about citations, this already signals that the data set has been used or reused in research, and we can then start building on that information. 
So as I mentioned, we want to develop and promote adoption of open data metrics, and we see this as a journey. Uh, the eventual destination of this journey is that we want to see data sharing as something that is incentivized for researchers. But at the same time, we know we are not there yet. Uh, there is a lack of incentives currently because research assessment frameworks often focus on publications in journals and don't necessarily include uh, data. This means that for many researchers, what they think about when they see data sharing is that they had to complete a particular burden, so complying with a policy, maybe by their funder or a requirement by a journal, but they don't necessarily see data sharing as something that will bring them professional benefit. So before we get to that point in which this practice is incentivized and included in uh, research evaluation frameworks, we need to go several steps back and get us started with some conversation even within our community to develop best practices around data metrics. And there's been quite a bit of work that has happened in this space for several years more broadly and also in several projects that make data count has been leading or participating in. For example, when we think about data citations, the Force 11 group uh, released the data citation principles. This is almost 10 years ago now in 2014. And these principles outline the purpose, function, and attributes of citations for data sets. Something that was quite important as part of these principles is that they recognize the necessity for these citation practices to work both for the human readers and users, but also to be machine actionable so that we could really feed this citation information into the different uh, workflows to, that make them discoverable and uh, available to the community. There's also been quite a lot of interest in the rate data repository and publisher communities in having some best practices for data citations and, and different resources and guidance have already been uh, published and shared with the community for those groups. Obviously, as we mentioned earlier, data citation is not the only element. There are other types of usage. And there's also been some work led by the Make Data Count Initiative in that space. Particularly, uh, several years ago, uh, Make Data Count collaborated with Counter, which is a standards organization uh, that provides guidance, particularly used by institutions and librarians to understand usage of, of digital objects in, in their context, originally to look at uh, usage for, for journals. Um, what came out from this collaboration was the Counter Code of Practice for Research Data, which provides a standard for repositories and platform providers to standardize how they generate and they distribute the reports for uh, usage metrics for the data they host. Um, another related effort in this space looking at uh, usage uh, beyond citations was the RDA Data Usage Metrics Working Group. Uh, that facilitated a number of community discussions on this topic and uh, published its recommendations last year and importantly endorsed the use of the counter code of practice for, for repositories to normalize uh, their usage metrics uh, and also to use data site for aggregation. So there's been a lot of work done to, to have the building blocks of the community best practices. And after having that in place, the next step becomes a, a, to adopt those best practices by the different stakeholders. Um, when we look at where we are now, we know that the adoption of the best practices is not where we would like it to be. Um, and essentially what we see is that there is some tension between the huge interest that there is by everybody in collecting this data usage information and actually um, the, the actual in implementation of the different practices. For When we look about this tension, one aspect is the fact that there is a certain effort required for researchers and repositories in collecting this data usage versus the potential reward or, or, or consequences of, of putting that effort in. And if we, if we put ourselves in the, in the place of repositories, there is this balance as well between saying, I want to incentivize researchers to share, but if I ask them a lot of information so that I make it most uh, useful and optimized for reuse, it may deter them from 
set in the first place because it's extra work, etc. When we think about the processes for normalizing and standardizing those reports for data usage, this is a process that can be actually quite time consuming uh, for repositories. And then looking at the other side of the workflows for publishers, um, the, again, there's been some community discussion around the best practices for them for, for collecting citations to data from their publications, but the publishers haven't really prioritized workflows, so they are not currently optimized for many journals in terms of capturing that data citation information. So to zoom in into these challenges, specifically for data citations, and look at this in, in a bit more detail, um, what we know is that collecting these uh, data citations Re the workflow requires several steps that involves different stakeholders that, again, may have different priorities um, in terms of implementation. And we need all of the steps here in this process to work beautifully and to have all of the uh, traffic lights in green so that the information actually propagates successfully through the process. So obviously, we need researchers to uh, provide citations for their data, not something that they always do. They have more of a, a tradition of um, citing journal articles, but it's not so common yet in some disciplines for uh, data. Then they can provide that information when they are depositing their data at a repository, but not all repositories capture the citation information. And we also know that there are some repositories, particularly in biomedical fields, that actually use accession numbers instead of DOIs, so they don't capture the same metadata. Uh, assuming that the repository uh, can, can capture that citation information, then we also need the publishers, again, to do their thing in terms of capturing that citation when this is added to the reference list in the in the article that they're going to publish. But the current workflows, as I was mentioning, they are not optimized, they are very leaky, and often this information is lost when the publisher is depositing their metadata in cross-refs, which means that, again, it doesn't get to the later stages of the process and into the event data service that is run by cross-ref and a data site. So essentially, what's happening is that we know that there are many instances of data usage and data citation that are actually uh, lost in the system. And there are many more instances of that that we, we are capturing at the moment. So at Make Data Count, we understand that you know this may be uh, something that has some challenges, but we believe that it is important that we all uh, get on board with prioritizing data metrics now. There was actually, if you, some of you attended the funder session earlier, somebody mentioned that we need everybody to row in the same direction. I totally agree. This also applies uh, to data metrics. And we think the time is now because we also need to understand that usage aspect of data so that we can inform data sharing best practices into the future. And at from our side, as an initiative, there are a number of things that we are doing to try to, again, get this as a priority on everyone's radar in the ecosystem. One of the things that we are doing is trying to get, uh, again, different stakeholders focus on this topic. And uh, for this uh, purpose, we hosted an event last month in Washington, D.C., where we wanted to have representatives across different sectors uh, and perspectives, so all across institutions, funders, but also government agencies and infrastructure providers to have focused discussions on data evaluation and this topic of data metrics. It was a very successful event. I think there was a very clear uh, support for making headways in, the, in this space and a recognition that we have now the standards and infrastructure in place that we can support further so that we scale how much data usage information we can make available to the community. Obviously, we will also need policy decisions in terms of assessment frameworks, et cetera, and a commitment to, to principles of responsibility and transparency and having contextualized metrics. But there was a lot of support for working in this space in the very near term. The other thing that we need to work on, and for this, I'm going to zoom back into, uh, into citations again, is that, again, we need to support this open infrastructure that uh, helps us scale. The reason why I'm uh, focusing now on citations is because um, many of you must have heard about cultural change and how taking that in incremental steps is important. This is one way in which we can take a first step that we can then use to support further cultural change, cultural change in other areas of, of data. Uh, usage. So citations particularly are valued by researchers. It's something that they tend to mention as something that is a motivator for data sharing. 
as I mentioned, there are workflows that we understand what needs to happen to capture data citations at repositories and journals that's there. And importantly, there are now new opportunities through technology that has advanced, for example, through machine learning to uh, identify mentions to data in ways that we couldn't before. So we think that the time is ripe now to try to address these challenges in the, in the workflows to simplify that process that I was showing earlier with different uh, steps and stakeholders. Let's try to simplify how we collect data citations um, and also aggregate those citations into a single place. Uh, again, there is a si simple port of call for the community to uh, get the information they need about data citations according to their needs. And this is the motivation for this project that I mentioned that we're working on is to develop the global open data citation corpus. We want this to be a comprehensive corpus that incorporates data citations from different sources into a single centralized resource that will be made available publicly to the community. The idea for the corpus is to incorporate citations from different sources. This includes uh, citations coming from the metadata deposit uh, at persistent identifier authorities, but also from other sources that are doing work through their organizations and their communities to uh, identify mentions to data, for example, by mining the full text of articles. There are a number of groups that have been working on this, and we think we can then try to aggregate all of those sources together into a single place. We are working in this project in iterative steps. Uh, we're still at the early, early stages of the prototype phase. Um, and to fit this prototype, we are using the information data citations already hosted through data site event data, as well as uh, data mentions uh, that come from a collaboration with the Zuckerberg Initiative that has been doing a mining of a corpus of uh, a large corpus of articles and preprints that they have available. And they also develop a model again to identify mentions to data on that corpus. After working on the prototype, we will continue to add additional sources and enhance the functionality of the corpus. And the idea is at the end to get to the production stage in a manner that the corpus, uh, the data citations in the corpus will be made available both through an API and a data dump. Um, the idea is that we also want to have tools for users that may not be coming at the corpus with programmatic uh, use cases to have a dashboard that allows them to get uh, data citations for their uses. And to give you a glimpse as to what we hope it may be possible in the future, um, I'm just going to display this video that gives you um, a, a show of what we have currently in terms of building that dashboard specifically for the data in the prototype. As you can see, there are a number of graphs that provides visualizations for different aspects of the data citations. And there are also tools that allow users to then do some filtering according to different facets, such as repository, affiliation, or publisher. So as I mentioned, the, the prototype specifically currently includes the data site event data and the data mentions from some Zuckerberg initiative. And, and it has this uh, basic user interface. Uh, we will also be making the seed uh, data file for the prototype available to the community. We are happy to have conversations with any groups who may be interested in, in looking at it and, and providing us with some uh, feedback. And before I just uh, wrap up, it was, let me see if I can move on. Yeah, um, I just wanted to do a final call for, for your input in helping us complete this picture around data citations. And um, obviously repositories provide a, a key piece in this puzzle. Um, so we recommend that you collect citation information for data sets and you deposit that with data set. The good news is that if you're already doing this, all of these citations will already be fitting into the corpus. So no extra work needed to feed those citations into the data citation corpus. However, we want this to be a resource that is also useful for repositories as, from the user perspective. And we are very happy to have your input and feedback on the development. So if this is something of interest to you, I encourage you to get in touch. We're very happy to have a separate conversation and get your input in more detail. And just a, a very a, this very brief additional item um, at Make Data Account, we're also very keen on highlighting success stories for data usage. So if you have any stories around the data um, that you host and how it has been used, 
uh, please do get in touch. I'd be very happy to talk about how we can amplify that for you. Um, so yeah, contact details and more information uh, there. I'm happy to address questions when we get to the Q&A. Thank you. Thanks, Irache, for this excellent talk. And um, I guess we get to the Q&A later. And, um... I would like to encourage all attendees to put your questions into the Q&A tool. And I'm now happy to announce uh, my colleague, Gabi Mejias, to talk about another data cited strategic initiative, um, the Global Access Program that we um, uh, launched uh, this year. And uh, also, um, yeah, more insights into the data site uh, Global Access Fund. And I'm really happy that you share these uh, insights with us. So. There you go, Gabby. Thank you so much, uh, Paul. And I hope you are seeing my slides correctly. Um, and yes, um, I will be talking to you today about another uh, of our strategic initiatives, the Global Access Program, and especially the progress we've uh, done um, throughout this year. And to start with, um, just for you to have a um, general overview of um, our community, um, currently we have uh, more than 280 uh, members um, in more than 50 countries. Um, overall, um, all those uh, members and organizations and repositories connected um, have registered more than 55 million DOIs. Um, so this sounds uh, really um, exciting. Um, however, um, as part of our uh, multi-year uh, strategically uh, plan uh, that we released um, a couple of years ago, um, we've encountered and identified some challenges for global adoption. Um, as I said before, we have institutional members in more than um, 50 countries and we actually do have um, consortia uh, in all the continents except Antarctica. However, um, most of our membership is still uh, based in Europe and North America. Um, we've also identified that in many countries, there's interest um, to adopt data site infrastructure. However, one of the common barriers is the lack of um, underlying infrastructure to integrate our tools and services. For example, the lack of a repository or other systems where our APIs and tools can be integrated. Another common challenge is um, the low awareness of the value of persistence identifiers uh, in some uh, regions, um, which prevents uh, adoption and uh, of course, uh, financial barriers to access. So in order to um, address uh, all these uh, challenges earlier this year, um, we launched the Global Access Program um, with funding support from the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative. And the goal of this program is to improve both equity and access um, to our PID infrastructure in underrepresented regions um, through a comprehensive integral approach. When I say uh, underrepresented regions, I'm talking about um, those regions that are currently underrepresented in the data site community, uh, Latin America, uh, Africa, uh, Asia, and the Middle East. And um, for this program, um, we've onboarded three uh, regional engagement specialists, uh, Mohammed, um, who's uh, the engagement specialist for Middle East and Asia based in Dubai, uh, Bosun, who is the engagement specialist for Africa, and he's based in uh, Nigeria, and Arturo, who is our uh, engagement specialist for Latin America, and he's based in Mexico. And um, all together, uh, they've been uh, doing a lot of work engaging and partnering with local communities. And I've mentioned that uh, what we want to do with this program is to implement a comprehensive approach. And this approach uh, consists in three uh, areas, um, funding. So we aim to uh, provide funding opportunities for these underrepresented communities so that they can overcome financial barriers. 
Infrastructure is the other um, area. So um, we uh, hope to support these local communities to develop the technical infrastructure needed to uh, benefit from data site infrastructure. And also, and very important, outreach. So we uh, want to work and partner with local community stakeholders to um, work together to increase awareness of the value of persistent identifiers. So let's start by um, zooming into the awareness and outreach work we've done so far as part of the program. Um, so as I mentioned before, um, our uh, team of regional uh, engagement specialists has uh, been um, uh, increasing and establishing uh, partnerships um, with uh, local communities in uh, Africa, Middle East, Asia, and Latin America. Um, we've also done a lot of uh, communication and engagement. We've uh, hosted this year seven um, webinars uh, in English, Spanish, Arabic, and Turkish, and there's an eighth webinar happening in November um, in Arabic. Um, and we're also um, working on establishing an ambassador's program. So we want to um, have a dedicated program um, to um, support individuals uh, in these uh, regions to advocate for the value of uh, persistent identifiers infrastructure and data site infrastructure. And um, as part of the outreach uh, focus, we're also developing a consortium mentorship program uh, to partner uh, uh, most uh, less experienced um, consortium lead organizations so that they can um, benefit from exchanging their experience. And uh, we're also developing case studies um, to showcase to the community how different uh, type of organizations uh, can use and benefit from data site. And um, we've been uh, attending a lot of events, uh, both in person and virtual uh, this year. Um, and um, a very um, special one was the data site connect event uh, we had in Buenos Aires uh, earlier in April this year. Um, and it was actually the, the first time we could meet together um, with our Latin American uh, community. And we had a strong participation of our um, Latin American consortia. And um, we hope to continue engaging with the community, both in um, in-person and uh, virtual events. And to uh, show uh, some of the growth we've had this year in these regions in terms of membership, this year, um, so far, we've onboarded three new direct members in China, India, and Saudi Arabia. And we've also onboarded 28 new consortium organizations, so organizations that joined um, data site through one of our um, national uh, consortia. And um, in Asia, we've onboarded 11 uh, consortium organizations. Um, 10 uh, in Japan and one in Singapore. In Latin America, we've also seen strong uh, growth thanks to our um, consortia uh, in Brazil, Chile, Colombia, and Mexico. And um, in Africa, we've onboarded seven members, six in South Africa and one in Morocco. And we've also seen um, repository uh, growth um, this year. So uh, Asia is the region uh, with the strongest um, repository uh, connection followed by Latin America and Africa. And um, this is um, the statistics of uh, DOI's uh, registration uh, in uh, these regions. Um, and you can see um, that the, the region uh, currently with the uh, highest number of DOIs registered so far uh, is Latin America, followed by Asia, Africa, and Middle East. Um, you can also see some difference between uh, the previous year and this year. Um, last year, we've onboarded, um, especially in um, Latin America and Africa, some organizations that had a huge backlog 
of outputs uh, that they wanted to register the OIs for. Uh, so that's uh, how um, or why you see this uh, difference between the previous and the current year. And now moving forward to um, infrastructure, um, we've been working on uh, a landscape analysis of um, infrastructure, technical infrastructure in each region to better understand um, where uh, we have the most immediate opportunities and where um, we need um, to work more supporting the community to develop this infrastructure. Um, so we've done, um, we've queried uh, many different uh, sources to obtain this information, um, including uh, ROAR, Open Door, um, with three data. And for Latin America, there's also some uh, national aggregators um, in Argentina, Costa Rica, Mexico, and Peru. And um, as you can see on the graphic, um, the countries with the highest number of repositories are Brazil, Colombia, and Mexico. And in these countries, we do already have a consortia established followed by uh, Argentina, Peru, and Ecuador. In these countries, uh, we don't have um, consortia uh, yet. We do have consortium organizations um, in Argentina and Ecuador, and um, we're working with uh, organizations in all these countries um, to discuss uh, membership and consortium membership. Um, in the Middle East, and North Africa, um, we've identified the countries um, with the highest number of infrastructure or repository infrastructure, Algeria, Iran, Egypt, Sudan, Saudi Arabia. And um, we do have a consortium uh, in Iran um, and in the other countries, um, we don't have a national consortia yet. In Africa, um, you can see that uh, the peak is uh, in uh, South Africa. And actually, we do have a lot of uh, South African universities that have joined uh, data site through the Fixture Consortium. And we also have um, an Ubuntu Net Alliance Consortium in, in Africa with members in uh, Malawi and Ethiopia. And um, in Asia, uh, as you can see, um, there's um, yeah a high number of repositories in Japan, followed by India, Turkey, and China. And in actually, or currently in Japan and China, um, we do have um, consortia. Um, and thanks to um, this analysis, uh, we can um, identify which are the countries that have the most immediate critical mass in terms of infrastructure to be able to adopt data site um, tools and services. And for the countries that don't have yet this uh, critical mass or have this, this lack of infrastructure, we can support them uh, through more awareness and also through uh, funding to develop that infrastructure. So that's what I'm going to talk about uh, next. As part of the global access program um, in uh, a couple of, of weeks ago, um, we launched the Global Access Fund, um, also with the support uh, from the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative. The goal of this uh, fund is to uh, help uh, organizations in Africa, Asia, Middle East, and Latin America to obtain uh, funding to make um, the research more discoverable and to benefit from um, data site, uh, DOIs, and infrastructure. Um, we do have three categories um, or three areas uh, where organizations can um, apply to. Um, we have um, uh, uh, funding for outreach activities. So for those who want to uh, develop projects to increase awareness about persistent identifiers, uh, DUIs, and, and more. Um, we do have um, another uh, funding category for infrastructure development. So for those organizations who don't yet have a repository system or other kind of uh, platform that they would need to uh, have to be able to, to benefit uh, from um, DOIs, um, this category is also available for organizations that already uh, have 
uh, a repository that already have a, an integration uh, with um, the data site API, but want to do more or want to build other services or things uh, on top of the existing integration and a bigger category with funding up to um, 50,000 euros for demonstrators. Demonstrators are um, projects with a, a higher um, or a broader uh, impact. So they will benefit not only um, an institution, but rather um, a country or a disciplinary community or a bigger community. We launched this fund uh, or the, the fund and the call for proposals the 1st of September. And actually the due date for applications is in a couple of days. It closes on October uh, 15. Um, and we plan to announce um, the awardees in December this uh, year. And um, the awardees uh, projects will run throughout um, next year. And we're also um, working to um, launch a call for support for the Global Access Fund. So we want to have this funding available again next year. Um, so we're going to um, launch a, a campaign uh, to call for uh, financial support to make this funding available again uh, to these underrepresented communities in um, 2024. And this is the end of the presentation and I look forward to uh, your questions. Thank you. Thanks so much, Gabi. And um, yeah, I think with that, we can get to the, um, to the Q and A section of this session. And um, I really see uh, two questions. I guess they're um, for more aiming at uh, Iraq's talk. So Irachim, you might want to tackle the first one by the uh, mm -hmm. anonymous um, attendee. Yeah, sorry, and I'm trying to put my camera on and I can't, I don't know if it's, I'm not trying to hide <laughs> from the questions. Okay. Um, but sure, yes. So thank you for the question. If this relates to the citations from a data set to another data set, um, the way that this is handling the metadata is not different from the citation to an article or to a preprint or to any other uh, object or resource. Um, okay, let's see. Oh, okay, hopefully you can see me now. Um, thank you. So essentially the main thing is to complete the metadata about that relationship between the data set and the, the other data set that is, is cited that first data set so in the same way as you would handle the, the citation for for other objects so it would be using the related identifiers uh, property within the uh, data site uh, uh, metadata and just providing the DOI for the data set that is citing again the original uh, data set that you are depositing so it's not different from any other way of, of including citations through the through the metadata for data set Okay, um, and the one by by Alex Ball, and I, I mm -hmm. want to point out to all attendees here that we have uh, right after this session, I have a nice uh, practice uh, or training session about data citation. Mm -hmm. So if you uh, are spontaneous and didn't uh, haven't signed up yet, uh, please feel free to do so. And uh, yeah, Iracha, if you want to respond, yeah, sure, to and wonderful. I was going to say yes that like we we have a session coming up um, that is going to dive into all of this. Uh, things in quite a bit of detail. Uh, but essentially, the answer to Alex's question is a yes, because essentially the corpus is going to be picking anything that counts as a citation to the data site based on the direction of that relationship, essentially to, to what you deposit for or in the metadata for, for the data set. So for the purposes of data set citations, um, data site counts is referenced by, is cited by, and is supplement to in the same way. So they are all treated in the same way. It will count as a citation for the for the data set. Right. Oh, the the other thing to complement this, sorry, briefly before I forget, is that the other thing that will count on citations uh, for the data set is the inverse relationship for the metadata from, for example, an article or another object 
uh, for the corpus we are focusing right now in citations uh, to data sets from, from articles, not because we don't think that from other objects are not important, it's just that because we know that there are many mentions in articles that we can leverage as a first step. But essentially, the inverse relationship will all, also count if the journal says is citing the data set. And I guess there's a follow up one um, for you, Ratcha, before I have another question for Gabby. How good counter you should set up for local hosted data? Uh... Okay, so if I'm understanding this correctly, this would be situations where you are you host data and there may not necessarily be a viewer download because you have platforms that allow users to actually you know utilize that data set on on that platform uh the answer to that assuming i understood the question correctly is that this has come up as a particular usage that we are not currently coll collating it wasn't covering the counter standard um, so it's something that we are aware of, and I expect it's, it's a practice that, again, is be, going to become more common. So we are very keen on hearing about these use cases from the community um, so that we can have those conversations as to how we can best find ways to collect that. The other thing I should probably mention in this context is that the counter code of practice was released in 2018, and we're actually in discussions for an iteration on the code of practice there was always a plan of revising it you know things move very quickly new uses appear as i was just saying and as this person suggested um so we expect that there is going to be some iteration and of course there will be some community consultation between be, you know as part of that process before the next version is is finalized yeah thanks Sriracha, for clarifying that um and maybe it's now we 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 could um I have a question for for Gabby, um so it might be interesting for for attendees here right now to to know what exactly you would do as a personal organization in order to apply for the open uh, global access fund. So um, do you have any recommendations about like what if there are any particular aspects to consider when you're submitting your application? Yes, um, I'm going to share um, the links for uh, with the information of the fund and the application form um, so that you can uh, take a look. Um, obviously, this closes on Saturday, so if you're interested in applying, uh, please hurry up. Um, um, and we uh, that the, the applications will be reviewed by the Global Access Fund um, committee, and then um, those applications that are selected will be shared with external reviewers. Um, and then um, after that selection, um, the selected projects uh, will be um, shared with the data side board, who will give the final approval. There's an application form where you need to. Um, clarify in which category are you applying what's the impact or who will be who will benefit from the from the project uh, how much funding you are asking for and um if you um would for a more solid application we strongly recommend that you also complete the documents that are marked as uh, optional in the application form uh, these are the project timeline template the project a budget template and a sustainability plan. If you are uh, applying for an infrastructure uh, project or a demonstrator project, and as part of your project, you want to register DOIs, one of the interesting things of this funding is that um, if you're an awardee, we will give you free access uh, to our services and DOI registration for the duration of the, of the project. Um, and uh, we ask you to uh, complete a sustainability plan um, to explain how you plan to sustain um, this project uh, throughout time. Thanks for sharing, Gabby. And um, now that we are still before the end of the deadline, uh, but what what about um, if you could tell us more about how the GAF awardees will run their projects, actually? So um, we aim to notify everyone in December and then... Um, we uh, want to support uh, the awardees next year through regular uh, calls uh, with DataSide and also with other awardees. 
so that um, you can receive support uh, from us uh, where we can help you, but that you can also um, exchange um, ideas, experiences, challenges with other awarded projects and to build um, yeah, a community of practice. And um, we're going to have regular uh, calls uh, to, to support the projects. And at the end, um, we are going to ask uh, the awardees um, to participate in a webinar and to participate in a blog uh, to share with the community um, the experience and also um, a final report of the project. Cool, thanks Gabby uh, for this information. and. Uh... Coming back to you, Rache, um, I think it might be of interest to to give a rough timeline of the development of the corpus, maybe, and uh, how organizations can participate in in the corpus, and uh, what what are the challenges, maybe, for them. Sure. Yes. So this is a project I just mentioned earlier. It's a project that is being funded by uh, a generous support by a welcome. Um, so the plan is to uh, work on the project for three years, so hopefully everything will be ready and beautiful um, by 2026. Um, we expect that we are going to be working very closely with different uh, stakeholders as part of the process, because essentially there are two aspects of how uh, organizations and groups or even individuals can contribute. One is obviously we're very keen on partnering with groups that uh, may be collecting data citations themselves um, to see if they're interested in contributing to these community resources. And say this will be an openly available resource for the community. Um, and we want this to be as comprehensive as possible. Essentially, we know that we are going to be capturing in the immediate some, some citations through mining the text that are going to be very has very focused on life sciences. So we want to make sure that there is coverage across disciplines uh, and type of, of mentions to, to data, etc. But essentially, we want to work with others who may be using their own tools or that they have systems to identify citations and collect those if they are happy to contribute them to the to the corpus, we are happy to have conversations because obviously this needs to be something where we we agree was the best way for everybody involved to get that information in a way that we can collect it and ingest it while still retaining the provenance. That's something that we are keen on doing. Essentially, when to be clear when a citation comes from the metadata for the for the data versus from other sources that so everybody knows where the information is coming from. Um, the other way of participating is that. Our vision for the corpus is that eventually it can be a tool that different stakeholders can use according to their needs. For example, repositories may want to use it to see oh, how, what are the citations for the data that I host, but according to what's the affiliation of the person that you know, created it, or according to the funders, do I have many more from, say, Welcome uh, versus somewhere else? Um, but we also want this tool to be something that can help with that aspect that I was talking about, uh, the, the updates to research assessment uh, framework. So, for example, if I'm an institution and money committee for tenure and pro um, promotion, I may want to incorporate evaluation of data, but I don't know where to go to find this information. It's very fragmented, so we want to work with institutional representatives to say, okay, how can we make this useful for that purpose? What's the type of information you need? Are you more interested? Obviously, we'll have affiliation information, but do you are you more interested in perhaps funder information or disciplinary information or what other facets are relevant? So I would say if you have citations, you can contribute to the corpus or, or you think it could be a tool for your uses in some form, uh, do get in touch. We're very happy to tell you more about it and, and keep you up to date again in our conversation so that we can incorporate your feedback. Thanks, Raj. And maybe with an eye on the clock, one final question. Um, uh, you, you already mentioned it somehow, but uh, does the corpus only include citations to data? And uh, will it include uh, citations to other research outputs as well? Yes, so this is the, the corpus of data citations. So we are focusing on data for now. As I was explaining in response to one of the questions, obviously data site collects citations to many other types of resources. Those are also important. You know, I'm a great believer in you know open science should be you know open everything, uh, all the types of of resources. Uh, the reason why we are focusing on on data citations is that I, as I mentioned earlier, cultural change takes some work, and if you do this in incremental steps, 
it tends to be easier. Um, and we know that there are essentially citations are something in particular where there is a lot of momentum through policy updates, et cetera, to support this evaluation. And also we know that this essentially the citations are there. It's just that we haven't been so good at surfacing it. So we think that there is an opportunity to leverage that, to focus on citations, but I think our eventual longer term vision is that the technology that will be supporting the corpus will also be applicable to other resources so hopefully there is the opportunity to do something similar for other resources in the future longer term thank you so much Irache, for uh sharing all this knowledge with us and um yeah once more thank you gabi also for your contributions and uh given um well there's one more question maybe uh Irache, give it a quick go um, measures being taken to ensure the quality of the data? Yes, so th this is a very good question and something that we've been having quite a few discussions about. One of the things, as I mentioned, is that we want to make sure that the provenance of the citations in the corpus is clear. It's something that we will be exposing uh, for a couple of reasons. One is because there are, if there are citations that are picked through different sources that can increase the trust in saying, okay, yeah, there was really a relationship, but also because again, the nature of this, what we call a citation maybe is slightly different because some of it will come from the metadata and some other things will be, oh, here's a, this model has told us that in this sentence, in this article, there is a mention to data. So we want to pr essentially provide some transparency around that we are we are we have been having quite a lot of discussions about this aspect in the context of our partnership with cci because again that's coming through the different model etc and it's something that we, we there's though they did some curation on the side when they were developing the model for training purposes but we are also taking a look at what is being ingested into the prototype in the first stage we know there will be some noise it won't be perfect um, but we also know that we shouldn't be, uh, we shouldn't let perfect be the enemy of the good. Um, so this is something where I expect we will be having additional conversations and something that we'll put in place as we do those collaborations with other potential sources. Essentially, so what are the steps that we need to put in place to uh, essentially reassure ourselves that we are happy with what is being added there? And in any case, again, provide that transparency as to what was the source and what was the framework by which we said this can be included in the corpus. Thank you so much, Iracha. And um, yeah, I'm really happy to to have heard all the all of this. You can find those slides on our Zenodo uh, dataset community. Uh, the link we shared in the chat. You can also see the recording of this and all the other sessions on our dataset YouTube channel. Please feel free to um, uh, participate in the exit poll that we right, have right now and also sign up for the next session that is the uh, training on the data citations as I just mentioned. And I really want to thank you, uh, the speakers, for their contributions, but all of you for joining and tuning in. So, um, yeah, see you at another event of Data Site. Thanks all.